the Florida Podcast Network, the voice of Florida. From Mallory Square in Key West to the Governor's Mansion in Tallahassee and all points beyond, you're listening to the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. Your source for all things related to the craft beer community in the Sunshine State. And now your host, Dave Butler. Welcome back to another episode of the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. This is Dave, your host and author, and we're going to go ahead and ignore beer for today. (laughs) We are going right into Mezcal, which I'm not going to lie, is starting to become, if it is not, my favorite spirit already. A little bit frustrating because obviously Mezcal cannot by law be produced anywhere but certain states in Mexico. But we got a lot of great Mezcals that are coming here to Florida and to the United States as a whole. And with the recent second anniversary Mezcal Lauderdale Fest, which you heard about on the Florida Beer Podcast a couple weeks ago, It was fantastic, but this time I actually brought my recording equipment with me, and so you're going to hear a lot from a lot of people, so it's really, really exciting, and I'm very, very happy to have brought it to you. If you don't understand Mezcal or Mezcal Lauderdale, recommend that you go back a couple of episodes with our interview with Andrew Martineau. He is the founder and the organizer for the Mezcal Lauderdale Festival. And absolutely fantastic. But he got a lot of great people to come to the event. And the first person that I'm going to introduce you to is Benjamin Nava. He is a chef. He is a host and he is a master mezcalier. He had done a couple of mezcal and food pairing classes during the event, during the sort of almost week long event. And he was actually at a tent himself with a couple of mezcals that he particularly enjoyed and was sampling those. And we were able to sit down with him for a few minutes and understand some of the nuances and some of the joys that come from from a very properly crafted mezcal. So that's where we're going to be starting today with Benjamin Nava, Master Mezcalier. If I got the name wrong, I do apologize, but you know, it it was kind of hot and crazy and I had had a lot of mezcal at this point. Anyways, enjoy. All right. So this is uh, Benjamin Nava, Chief Master Mezcalier. How has the event been for you? I'm doing great. Uh, this event is uh, really amazing, and um, it offers a, a lot of uh, different expressions through the Mexican spirits, Bacanora, Sotol, of course, Mezcal, and other ones. And it's a really, really good opportunity to, to taste and to find that expression that you really like to drink. Obviously, this has been normal in Mexico for decades and decades. How far behind is the U.S. Mezcal market from uh, the Mexican market? Well, it's very interesting because as uh, export product, the States is the number one country after Mexico that buys Mezcal. But uh, the culture, it's very important that it's very unique this mezcal culture in Mexico, and we want to we try to share overseas here in the states and other countries. And the people they are asking and they are looking to learn more about this mezcal culture. And festivals like this they offer this opportunity to to the people to learn more about the mezcal. Now, you did a food pairing event here, and you had mentioned that the best way to taste a mezcal is to pair it with food, which I guess makes a little, like, I would assume that the best way to just taste it would be to just taste it straight up. What is the benefit of a proper pairing with mezcal and food to the consumer? Well, as a professional chef, 
I know a little bit of, uh, of food. And you have to, to taste both the food and the, and the mezcal. Uh, talking about pairing with spirits that has a uh, higher uh, proof, it's a little bit difficult because you have to avoid in the food the acidity and the piquant uh, flavors or notes. So it really, it really pair well with a lot of type of food. I've been doing this type of exercise a long time ago with different styles of food, Italian, uh, Japanese, uh, Chinese, of course, some really good real steaks. And you have to, to taste and to decide to, to try these new flavors with the mezcal because from agave to agave, the profile of flavor will change and it will, won't taste the same using the espadín, for example, with fresh ceviche, with, with fish, instead of a very complex, or not complex, just for example, a Italian pizza with prosciutto and rucola. Gotcha. One last question, and something that I've never seen in any sort of distilled spirit is the use of meat when it comes to flavorings. Because I know we have some over there that use chicken, uh, chicken mole. We've got a turkey one, and then you had poured us a sample of one that used a rabbit. Is that a common experience when it comes to mezcal? This is not that common. Actually, this particular mezcal is the pechuga, it's the name. They start doing it like 150 years ago, more or less, as a ceremonial mezcales on the Day of the Dead, the Dia de Muertos, or in the Holy Saint of the small village. So it's a full ceremony where the people sacrifice the animal, and then they use seasonal fruits, and... The cosmovision is that the animal gives their soul into the bottle of the mezcal. So there are a lot of uh, mezcal de pechuga, very unique. I have taste, for example, this one, especially from the north part of Mexico, Durango, that uses rabbit and fruit. But another brands, they use venison, they use iguana, they use lamb, local products. And it's part of their cosmovision in those small villages in Mexico. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. It's my, my honor to be part of your podcast and keep drinking mezcal and learning more about, about this authentic Mexican spirit. Absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah, that was a fantastic interview. I was really, really happy to, to speak to him. But now let's actually talk to some representatives. Some of these people are going to be from mezcals or other spirits, other agave spirits that you can find around Florida. Some of them are still searching for distribution deals. And so definitely, if something sounds interesting, and trust me, it's all going to sound interesting, I would definitely take a look at their websites or check them out on social media. There are a couple of other places where you can find mezcals. One of the presenting sponsors for the event was Primo Liquors. And so it seemed like everybody was on the shelf at Primo when we were there. So we're going to be starting with Nelson Giacometto from uh, Mezcal Rosaluna. Uh, Andrew Bernauer from El Viaje Spirits. That's actually a Ricea, which is another very, very similar agave spirit uh armando conway is actually from zikaru and if you remember we were actually speaking to dennis barnett who is the main importer of zikaru here in the united states last year armando's with the team and he was actually mixing drinks which was fantastic reed spear who is from real mezcal the mezcal that we're speaking to him about is cuenta cuentos which means storyteller in spanish but they also had a couple of interesting mexican rums that were fantastic to try adriana perez mercado is from mezcal amaras and juan carlos cachua is from mezcal santo gusano who is actually there trying to find 
distribution as well. Hopefully we'll be able to get all of that done. And then we're going to finish it up with Connor Schrago from St. Killian Imports there with Granja Nomada, which was another fantastic Mezcal brand. So that's a lot of people. Um, if you want more details, if you want to get the websites, make sure to check out our show notes. Uh, but first and foremost, we're going to speak to one of our favorite Mezcals at the event, my one of my wife's favorite Mezcals at the event, Mezcal Rosaluna with Nelson Giacometto. Everybody's going to be following after that. So there's a lot of information coming to you pretty quickly. I know you're going to enjoy it. And let's get to it. <laughs> I am not allowed to walk away without speaking to Rosa Luna. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much. And uh, so nice to see you and meet you again. So thank you so much for coming by. Absolutely. Name, title, and who are you representing? Uh, Nelson Giacometto, and this is Rosaluna Mescal, and I am the state manager and minority owner of Rosaluna Mescal. So give us a quick rundown of Rosaluna and how it sort of sets you apart on a, from a beautiful spring-summer day with a lot of other Mezcals in the area. Well, first of all, I'm thrilled that you guys are here supporting the cause. We appreciate that. We're elevating the category that is Mezcal. Um, Secondly, our hallmark of singularity would be that we are the second eldest Palenque in all of Oaxaca. Our nom is 002. We go back six generations, and we tout ourselves as the less smoky mezcal. Um, and so we didn't do that for marketing reasons. Of course, that was uh, not predetermined or predicated. We just did it the way we wanted to enjoy it. And so you'll find that with sipping Rosaluna, you're going to get toasted almond and toasted walnut and a little bit of citrus and toronjas or uh, grapefruit in English um, and a slight smoky appearance that makes it a broadband universal crowd pleaser when it comes to making cocktails. You can go from A to Z and it's great. Let's talk about mezcal versus tequila in the Mexican market because you know talking about those two spirits here in the U.S., a lot of people just assume, oh, mezcal is just a treated tequila. It's an inferior tequila. It's a different tequila. Um, does the Mexican market really understand the differences between the two spirits? Well, it's, it's for the reason that we're here today. The Mexican market undoubtedly understands the difference between the two. I liken it to the same sort of nomination as you would find in sparkling wine or cava or prosecco and champagne. You know, it's just nomenclature based. And as the market begins to educate itself and it broadens the palate and the awareness to the consumer, we're allowed and afforded the opportunity to taste so many different varietals and make a determination of our own as to which which aspect we, we, we wish to lean towards. And I think that's the magic of, of mezcal versus tequila. It's not about better or lesser or, or poorer quality. Listen, with tequila, you have 100% Blue Weber Agave. That's one varietal. You have upwards to three, or 30 or 300, depending on who you're speaking with, of uh, varietals of agave. And that gives you so ma an infinite opportunity to taste each and every one and discover for yourself. And what agaves did you use for Rosaluna? Espadín. We're 100% Espadín. Um, and like I said, we are vertically integrated. Um, and... The idea about it is that we want to leave the land in the same treasure cove as we as we once inherited it uh, for generations to come. That is absolutely paramount for us. So we're located in the valley of Matatlan, and for that reason, our terroir offers us and affords us a unique character that's very specific to our land. How has the reception been to Rosaluna here at uh, Mezcal Lauderdale? I think, you know... Everybody loves free goods, and that's great. And everybody loves uh, the brand when you give out some cool stuff. But overall, uh, excuse me, overall, I feel like people are really thrilled of, of the opportunity of tasting something that was a little different than what they were expecting. So over, overall, I, I feel like we had a very positive result. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. It's, it's great what you're doing to your listeners and to everybody out there. You're doing God's work, man. So thank you. I appreciate you. <laughs> So I guess I will start off with name, position, and the brand that you're representing. Yeah. So my name is Andrew Bernauer. I am the founder and owner of El Viaje Ricea. And I have not heard of Ricea yet. Um, obviously, being at last year's event, we were exposed to Mezcal, obviously, and Bacanora and Soto, but Ricea I have not heard of before, and I know the uh, festival organizer was very excited to have some of these here. So what is a Ricea? 
Sure. So, Ricea, first off, it's very new to the U.S. market. It was only legalized in 2019 when it received its denomination of origin. So, very new to the U.S. market. It's a agave spirit from the western region of Jalisco. There's two types of Riceas. There's a mountain and a coastal Ricea. El Viaje is a mountain Ricea. It came from, comes from the Sierra Madre Accidental Mountain Range. It's 100% agave maximiliana, which is a unique agave species in that region. It's also cooked in an above-ground adobe mud brick oven, which gives it a less smoky flavor. Very big botanical and floral, almost like a gin and very citrusy as well. So it's got a unique flavor profile and just very new to the market for everyone as they've not heard of it before. And you were saying that it's definitely got a lot of uses, obviously straight or on the rocks, but you've also mentioned that there's a lot of mixology sort of uses that I see it can definitely slide into more so than maybe some of the other spirits at the event. Sure. So there's a lot of opportunities for mixology. And, and really what we've seen interest in is putting it in gin cocktails, things like The Last Word, Bee's Knees, all things of that nature. It really blends well because it doesn't overpower the cocktail. It's not overly smoky. So it's more diverse from a mixology standpoint. There's a lot more that bartenders can do with it. So not only is it unique and complex on its own serve neat, but from a mixology standpoint, there's just a lot more that mixologists can do with it as well. Awesome. So at the event, since this is relatively new to the U.S. market, how has the interest been? Have a lot of people been intrigued by what this is and come in and actually been receptive to it? Sure. So the reception's been great. People have really, really gravitated towards it. They've never had an agave spirit that tastes like this. I mean, to be botanical and floral uh, and not overly smoky, but yet have the agave flavor, have these unique characteristics, they're very surprised by it. And it's been a great transition spirit as well for people who like tequila, but maybe are overwhelmed by some of the more traditional mezcals from Oaxaca and those regions, they've really gravitated towards this. So the reception's been great thus far. Very awesome. And hopefully they'll be on the U.S. market relatively soon. Fingers crossed. Yep, exactly. And I'm here, you know, throughout the Southeast working on Florida now. And the object is just to grow it further throughout the U.S. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks for having me. Perfect. All right. Let's see. I can get your name and, brand and stuff from your email. Let's start off with the relative mixology opportunities that come from mezcal is it an ingredient that you can do a lot with uh the, yes of course it's uh, many mezcal has many levels of smokiness so depending on what the you know how smoky is you can use it for different type of cocktails right but you can make from a simple margarita to a beautiful negroni with it so i think it's very versatile just because of how many different brands are out there so you can really play and make really cool stuff you know i think i think i think mezcal is it's here to stay and it's gonna be a, a staple in every bar you go in the world you know and with zikara there's so many different expressions that you have that are i guess available when you really come to try to find a good drink how do you get started obviously i would you would start with the expression first and then how do you go from there we have so many uh, expressions and expression will I think will go very well with uh, the type of cocktail that you want to make right for example I made some cocktails today for the festival and the silver I used it for a cocktail that's going to be light and bright right then I use the añejos for cocktails that maybe a uh, Manhattan style cocktail old fashioned uh, reposados perfect for palomas and then we have the 102 which is a high octane mezcal that goes through cocktails very well and then you can really tell the difference between you know the type of mezcal that you want to use for different cocktails right and then with, uh, what about just drink, drinking neat or drinking on the rocks? How do you differentiate which is good for a, just a pure distillation, pure experience with the spirit? Uh, from our brand in, in particular, I think that we, because we have so many options, you get the, you get the silver for the purest, the like just the agave, the, the way it comes raw from the mountain. And then you get the people that like bourbon, right? They want to introduce themselves into, they, they already done tequila, now they're moving to mezcal, so... They're utilizing our expressions to do that, right? It's a, it's a uh, training wheels per se. It's a perfect, you know, to go into the mezcal world. Yes. Awesome. Now, obviously, since you were, or since Zikaru was here last year at Mezcal Lauderdale, there's been a brand new expression that you just brought out. Can you give us a little rundown of that? Yeah, we just got a beautiful tobala. This tobala has a, the, the the plant took like 12 years to grow. Obviously, you, tobalas means wild agave, so you mean you can't be touched by humans. Had to grow by itself. Uh, the way I the way I, I describe tobalas is like imagine that you're you having a daughter; she's one year old, and then you find this plant in the mountain that you know it's perfect. So when she turns thirty, it's her wedding. Now you're gonna go take them, scale and steal it. So that's a tobala for me. 
Uh, it's perfect neat, hard to get, beautiful expression. I think for me, it's the favorite of all, the, all, all that we have in the, in the brand. And I know that it was sort of created as a, an homage and a celebration of Zikaru's original Mescalero. Correct, yeah. He, from the house, they wanted to make something that represents uh, the story of the guy that you know, started all with us, you know? So, yeah. It's kind of amazing. And with uh, Zikaru, I guess, are you going to continue to create new expressions? Are you going to cr- continue to try to push the boundaries of what you're doing with the agaves that you have? Or are things pretty well good for what you have in terms of the lineup of expressions that are going on right now? And you just kind of want to promote that. I think that the beautiful thing about Mezcal is so many options out there, so many new things that, you know, that this, uh, uh, the owner, Dennis, and uh, the Mezcaleros, are they're going to decide in the future there's more things they should bring to the market. But I think they're doing it very smart. I think they're just bringing stuff slowly, little by little, so everyone gets to know the brand. And they don't have like 1,400 type, types of mezcals that people get like lost in it, right? I think it's the, perf- the, the, the way they're growing is perfect. But I would love to see if they're going to do a Toba Diche or like, you know, I don't know, anything, 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 the stuff that I like, you know? Gotcha. With the amount of uh, expressions that you have, last question here is if somebody's interested in trying to figure out where to start, what would you give them? I will go directly for our silver. That's, that's, that's where you get the best taste of the plant that we're, the plants that we're using. You, this is the this is that's the perfect start point for a person that never had mezcal, or for someone that wants to dive in into our brands, right? Then from there, then you get the option to try the reposado, try the añejo, and then you get, I think get into the expressions, right? Awesome! Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. So hopefully, uh, I was able to uh, open some light in, about the brand. You know, thank you so much. So I guess let's start with your name, your position, and who you represent. My name is Reed Spear, and I own Cuenta Cuentos Agave Spirits and Sook Rums. There are so many things to talk about, but let's start with Cuenta Cuentos. What does that actually mean? It means storyteller, and the name comes from the fact that every bottle of mezcal tells a story. Um, from where the plants were grown to who harvested them and the time and the labor and the love that went into making them. Uh, they call it the 400 decisions. So which agaves you chose, what wood did you roast it over, how long, um, you know, what kind of wood are your fermentation vats made from, um, what time of year was it made, that affects the yeast that are in the air, what vegetation's nearby, uh, was it distilled in copper, was it distilled in clay, was there any aging involved? Were there any adjustments involved? Did you use colas? Did you use puentas? Did you use water? There's a lot of decisions and a lot of, I guess, different things that will affect it. And you can definitely taste a lot of those decisions and a lot of those changes in the different expressions, can you? Absolutely. And that's what brings people into Mezcal and what keeps them around. So even if you take this, what we call an expression, is the person who made it plus the agave. That's an expression. Even from one expression to the next, one batch to the next, you're going to taste subtle differences because the seasons change or the, the place where the agaves were harvested would change. You know, Even if it's the same agave, the same person, everything else is held as constant as possible. It's just you're going to end up with subtle differences. And so for the agave enthusiast, I like to say you don't get a customer, you get a turn at a customer because they want to try everything. And I love, there's so many wonderful brands here at the show that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. So, you know, I I love walking around and seeing what's happening too, you know. It's amazing because with the labels, the ones that you're showing us, and we'll put them up on social media, there's so much information on them. And it's it, for a spirit in the United States where it's generally the same product over and over and over again and that sort of monotony is key, it's interesting to see you not only embracing the subtle changes, but advertising them as sort of a bonus. Is it difficult to enlighten the average drinker here as to those differences and why they should be celebrated? Yeah, the average drinker, yeah. But I got it. You know, in my opinion, it's those it's those differences and the um, the let's let's say we the faults are the features, right? The the things that wouldn't be normally standardized out of a product and a vodka or something like that on a mass marketed product is what's bringing people into the category. 
Um, it's just like uh, the rise of Whole Foods and uh, you know previously industrialized food economy, where you have a desire for people to meet the the farmer, to meet the maker, to understand uh, the, and and appreciate the transparency in a product. That's what's bringing people into mezcal. It's the it's the antithesis of what tequila had become. Now, the other thing that you brought here, and I was a little amazed because I've never seen this before, is rum, Mexican rum. It's, it's traditionally a Caribbean sort of assumption, sort of uh, localization. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. And, and actually, rum has a deep history in Mexico as well. The Spaniards ran Solera systems in their rum production in Mexico and, have, and, and, and left that behind. So we actually have here rum from uh, the Mije people in the Sierra Mijes of Oaxaca. This is a cloud forest region. These people have inhabited this region for 4,000 years by their reckoning. It's a very insular community that I happened to meet in 2019 at Mexican Labor Day. One of these Mije uh, Indians was working at the bottling factory, and I struck up a conversation with him. Long story short, here we have their beautiful rums, and they're they're not rums in the stu- in the sense that most people are familiar with them. They're not column still distilled molasses. These are fresh sugarcane juice fermented in clay pots and then distilled twice in copper. You know, to get this product, we're up at 4 a.m. We do a five-hour drive into the Sierra Mije. We hike down 9K uh, to the uh, Furbica where they're made, and we pack the stuff up on mules and hike it back up out. So it's a long day. And then we have the the aged rum here. We're actually using a Solera system and new oak out of uh, the Burgundy region of France. And so you've got an incredibly rustic product with a very, very long history behind it and an interface with uh, a traditional uh, European way of aging, too. So and they're both wonderful products. And honestly, they often steal the show when I'm showing them with the mezcal. So... Awesome. I definitely want to try a little bit. And thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. you having me on the show. Thanks, man. It's been a great uh, pleasure meeting you. Uh, first and foremost, name, title, and who you represent. Yes. So my name is Adriana Perez. I am the new market manager for South Florida for Mezcal Amaras. Awesome. And so what kind of expressions did you bring to Mezcal Lauderdale today? So we brought a different expression of Mezcal. What we really hone into on our brand is pretty much from seed to sip, right? So we have the espadín, which is aged, well, after eight years, we harvest them. We have cuprieta, that after 13 years, we harvest them. And then we have our kind of like our limited edition, like sacotorro, which we have to wait about 10 years to harvest, our azul, we have to wait about eight years to harvest. And those are like the more limited edition ones that we have. Mezcal Amaras, what we, our philosophy is giving back to our community. So we, we really hone into our 20% of our net sales or about 20% of our net sales goes back to Oaxaca and our community and our pretty much educating our maestros mezcaleros and also our jimadores. So all of our profit is really honed into kind of like protecting the agave, reforesting, and pretty much giving back to the community so we can protect the mezcal and the way that we make it. It seems that mezcal isn't so much a particular plant as much as it is a community project, that it really is the villages and the towns and the people that are making it more so than the actual maguey that it's used to produce it. Yes, that's completely correct. So what we really want to like focus on is like the ancestral way or the artisanal way of making things. What that means, it's really like man labor. So the whole process is like they are before like or Himadoras know exactly when to harvest these plants right before like we have the right energy on that piña. And after that, it's either our horse with our Egyptian mill that actually goes around to extract the juice right before yeast starts happening happening or our men that actually go around it's called maso and canoa it's literally like they're massing and macerating these um, piñas roasting them in a pit with uh, natural river stones and oak um, oak trees 
And after that, it goes to natural fermentation. Our natural fermentation, we only add about like, like spring water and we let that ferment about 30 days. And then we'll go through the distillation process. The first distillation is the shishi, what they call the locals, which they use locally. It's not mezcal. And then the second distillation was where the mezcal comes. And that's where it could be two or three distillation processes. The, that's what we have our mezcal um, maestros really decide what's going to come out and, you know, how many distillation processes. But, yes, we're completely natural. We don't add anything. We don't use machines. Everything is labor, labor, community, terror, and what can we give back to the community. So I'm very proud to be representing this brand. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for your time. All right. So I've got your information. Can you, uh, I guess, introduce us to your brand a little bit? Thank you. Well, Santo Gusano is mezcal from Oaxaca. It's made of espadín agave, which is the most common agave that you will find uh, elsewhere. And the reason behind that is because the rest of the agaves are, are really uh, wild. and They cannot be reproduced. So that's why we, we do not encourage using those agaves to make mezcal, because they can become extinguished. Besides that, our mezcal is... 80% proof and very low uh, smokiness. And that's because we do not use other, other, other woods to, uh, in the process of the cooking of the agave plants, of agave hearts. So it's, it's very important to, to also take care of only a small percentage of pine wood and the other woods uh, where, which are regional woods that we use in the process. And not only that, but also not using the agaves that are in contact with the woods, which once the process takes place, that all normally takes seven days, will get burned, the ones that are in contact with the woods, and we discard them. So we understand that the, the smokiness uh, at the end is just part of the process, but if the smokiness is too... Uh, strong in a, in a mezcal is a defect. We understand that, and we don't want to encourage that kind of mezcal. And I kind of find that interesting because especially with last year's event, you know, a lot of people played up the smokiness and really appreciated it, whereas with this year's Mezcal Lauderdale, a lot of people are talking about how well they've been able to control that. Um, do you find that that amplifies the drinkability both straight and in the cocktails that you can use it for? Definitely. We, we knew through uh, marketing research that most of the consumers did not like the smokiness when drinking it uh, neat. So that's the first step of really understanding and liking mezcal. So we, we came out with a mezcal that would be nice to have uh, a neat, straight, or in cocktails. So uh, we, first of all, lowered the alcohol content, which most of them are 90, almost 200 proof, to 80 proof. And also, the smokiness was controlled in the process. So that, that gives uh, not just that, but also the origin of our agave is mainly from San Dionisio Cotepec, Oaxaca, which is where we produce it. So we do not use other agaves from other regions. And that also gives us a consistency in our flavor. That's awesome. So at today's event, obviously, most of the pouring, and you have some... Uh, mixed drinks as well is with the and is with your straight blanco i guess what other kinds of expressions will you have once you come into the market we are uh, mainly promoting the the espadin agave as i said before and uh, we also do the reposado reposado has uh, six months of uh, oak barrel white oak bark, um, and uh, we also have a four times the steel um, uh, espadin, which is the only one in the market so far, which brings a, a totally different profile to the mezcal. And uh, we're working on an añejo, eight years of uh, um, barrel as well. So that, those are the four types of uh, mezcals that we have today. 
And how has the reaction been to you here at Mezcal Lauderdale? Has this been a good event to get the word out and kind of create some more brand awareness as you're coming into the market? Definitely we think that uh, being here, our presence in this type of events is, is key to the promotion of Mezcal as a category, but also for people to understand the, the difference between every Mezcal producer, which uh, has its uniqueness in flavors and, uh, and uh, you know, at the end, uh, everyone has uh, their own flavor profile. But as long as it's mezcal, then you can be able to uh, feel the difference or taste the difference between the different uh, mezcals. That's why we felt it was important to be here so people can really taste all the different mezcals, espadín, and be able to tell the difference. And we also uh, are promoting uh, some mixologies, mixology of mezcal with uh, certain ingredients. So some people that are not used to drink it uh, straight or neat may also be able to enjoy it. I definitely ex enjoyed that experience with the uh, mule that you had here. And it was interesting to see that people are really ex excited and are willing to mix mezcal a lot more than they seem to be willing to mix straight tequilas. Yes, I think mezcal has so many different options to mix with that um, it makes it also very interesting for uh, people that are maybe not uh, willing to, to drink it straight. But we want to encourage, encourage people to try it first neat with uh, a certain type of food because this is a, a really uh, interesting product to pair with seafood, for example, and also with desserts. So both of them are, uh, go very well with mezcal uh, straight. So it's not just about uh, drinking mezcal. It's just about, it's about pairing it with, uh, with food. So that, that's what we're trying to um, uh, somehow teach people to try it. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it, and I can't wait to get my hands on a bottle myself. Thank you for the opportunity of letting people know about our mezcal. All right, so let's start with your name, position, and who you are representing. My name is Connor. I'm the regional sales manager for St. Killian Importing with our brand Granja Nomada. That's kind of awesome. So one of the things that you mentioned about Granja that was kind of awesome compared to everything else is that it is majority woman-owned. Yep, so it's a woman-owned business. It's a husband and wife team. She is the brains behind the operation, and he is the, uh, the brawn behind the operation. Gotcha. Is that something that you see a lot of or you don't see a lot of, especially Mezcal? Uh, and tequila and Mezcal production, it's, it's kind of a large aspect of it because it's such an ancestral and it's been going on for so long that a lot of the women are still very involved in the process. And so what, I guess, makes Granja so attractive to you to where you decided to import and distribute this here in the United States? It's just so approachable. The flavor profile is so unlike anything on the market. Um, super light on the smoke, super soft, and like I said, just overall approachable. Which is kind of amazing. Um, do you recommend any sort of preparation? Do you prefer this neat? Do you prefer this on the rocks? Is this good for mix? How do, kinda, how do you generally use that? However you want to drink it is the, the right way to drink it. I usually do it neat, but just a simple mezcal margarita is perfect as well. When it comes to mezcals, what is the traditional way of actually enjoying it? Traditionally, we're going to sip it neat, maybe with a little grapefruit or orange slice, a little bit of worm salt on the side, but a Paloma is always a perfect pour for it as well. Which is kind of amazing. And this can be found here in the United States, that is correct? Correct, yep. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So thank you so much to everybody that came out and participated and was able to speak to us. You know, obviously these festivals are not done just for myself. There's plenty of other people there. And, well, I find it interesting that now going to festivals like this, they have a number of people that see 
someone with a microphone and a recorder and a pair of headphones, and they know exactly what's going on. Went ahead and interviewed a couple of attendees that were at the event, some of which came up to me. And I'm just going to go ahead and leave it at that. Enjoy. <laughs> Hey there, how are you doing? How are you enjoying Mezcal Lauderdale today? Well, this is our second time here. We were like here last year, and this is our second event, and we live like right around the corner. It's amazing. I just kind of expected it more like some covered area, but wow, that tequila over there, Lavandas, oh my gosh. They make they like like they have a cool like a container that's like has a like a watermelon blend. It was like one to one ratio, he said, and it's, it's so spectacular. I had like five cups. So yummy. I've sent a lot of people there. What other kind of expressions, what other kind of tents have you been uh, enjoying today? Well, I was in the line for the, where they had the, the that kind of, I don't know what you call it, the, I forget the brand name, but they had the, the cup, the special. They had the mule. Yeah, the mule. That was, oh, that was a great drink. It was so refreshing in this heat. <laughs> Excuse me. But yeah, it was such a hot event, but that was a refreshing drink. It was worth waiting for in line. Um... I think everything here is really special because um, there's this liquor store right next door called Primo's that has apparently a discount on all the, all these uh, brands that are here today, which is unique. Um, so that makes it more attractive to you know first time purchasers. I like the tequila, this, this mezcal in the freezer, so I kind of just have it in the freezer and take a shot when I want just something you know just unique taste, and it uh, it, it it it's very good. So this it's amazing how many different brands there are. And different flavors. Like, to understand, it's just a little overwhelming at some because some table has 12 different brands to try, 12 different flavors. But I think it's a beautiful experience. So I'm happy to come a second year in, in advance, yeah. Do you think that with the different flavors and varieties and expressions that you're seeing today that you may even just get away from tequila altogether and just go for things like mezcal, bacanora, so on? As I mentioned, I have some mezcal in my freezer. And because I don't drink with mixes so i have basically excuse me i had some crickets and they were good but they're stuck in my throat i need to wash them down but i normally basically drink um mezcal frozen with a little bit of lemon and water on ice and that's my drink that's what i go to that's amazing. I may have to try that myself with some of the mezcal that I have at home. That's awesome. What's your name? My name is Alan. Alan, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, pleasure. Oh, oh. It's, it's audio. It's all audio. It's all audio based. You're fine. I can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, podcast. There we go. Absolutely. You know what you're talking about. All right. So, yeah, it's cool. What's your name? Caroline. Awesome. And this is not your first time to Mezcal Water. This is your first time? First time to the Mezcal event, but I've been to Canyon Ranch before. Okay. Well, I guess in terms of Mezcal, did you know what it was? Were you exposed to it before today's event? I'm aware of it because I work for Moa Hennessy, but, and I, I'm starting to like tequila, but Mezcal was something I really didn't know. So I wanted to explore it. So that's why I came. So I wanted to really learn about mezcal and try different flavors and learn about it so I can get more knowledge about it. Were you able to get a good amount of knowledge at an event like this? Yes, yes. I learned a lot and, and, and different, you know, combinations. And a lot of the mezcal is made in Os... Os... What is it? Oaxaca. Oaxaca, Oaxaca. <laughs> I speak Spanish and I'm here, like, having a hard time. Oaxaca. A lot of the tequila in, reg in general is made in Jalisco, but Oaxaca, I learned this where they may do the mezcal, which in Mexico is considered like a higher quality. It's like like better than than the Cristalino and the Extrañejo. Gotcha. And I would assume with, with you know, Moe Hennessy, they've got a number of tequila brands in their portfolio. You only have one. It's only one. There's a Volcan tequila. And it's and the the the, the non fifteen thirty two whatever the where they make it is the only one where they make only that tequila from Blue Weber Agave. It's really nice, very smooth. I, for me, someone that's never been into tequila at all, been afraid of it. I've been able to embrace it because of the food pairings that I actually do brand education sampling. So, in one of these stands, they had actually some oranges with some. 
uh, dark salt, red salt, and I was like, okay, we got to go here because this is really how you enjoy real tequila. Mezcal, whatever it is, you, that's how you enjoy it with a food pairing because you can just drink anything, but it's not going to be the same until you have it with food or with some type of, of something. Because in Mexico, what I learned was that people have tequila in Mexico because they eat such spicy foods. When you have a tequila, it actually neutralizes the spiciness of the food that you're eating. So it becomes like a happy medium. And I learned that while doing brand education samplings with the tequila brand that I represent. So when I, I did that with him and I was like, come on, he doesn't know. So I'm like, let's go and try it. And I, I experienced the same thing again. So it's really nice. It's really nice to... Awesome. Do you see yourself uh, being more of a mezcal or bacanora or soda drinker after uh, an event like this? No, I'm more Cristalino. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Did you try any other ones that were really good that you went for that you really could see yourself purchasing? Um, I did like some. I took pictures of the ones that I liked. I don't remember the name right now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for her was listening, but I did take pictures. <laughs> um, I did see some that I really liked that I took pictures of them because right now I'm a little buzz. So when you're a little buzz, you can you got to take pictures and then you later look at it and write because I am the, the, the liquor store nearby. Uh, my coworker, he manages, he, he oversees that as far as like as a merchandiser. I'm a merchandiser for the brand, but I'm in Hollywood. So I'm like, okay, Primo Liquors, I have it in Southwest Ranches. I'll go over there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Nice meeting you guys. Thank you. So we are here at the Quinta Quintos booth. Why do you say that this is the best booth that you have seen here at uh, Miss Cal Lauderdale? Honestly, because. One, the attention to detail, the explanation of everything, but the taste is exact. He doesn't give you, a, a, like, what do you expect? He asks me what you taste, and it's exactly what I described. And it is too, it's on point. Very. Have you, could you describe yourself as a Mezcal drinker before this, or is this your first experience with the spirit? So I've had Mezcal plenty of times, and... To my experience, it's a smoky drink, and from this from this event, I've learned some most mezcals tend not to be like the higher end tend not to be smoky at all. Do you prefer a smoky mezcal, or do you like it a little bit smoother? I like it a little bit smoother. That's just me. As but there are some smoky ones that I could drink all day. Awesome. What's your name? Brandon. Brandon, it's nice to meet you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sure. What's your name? My name's Megan. Hi, Megan. Is this your first time coming to Mezcal Lauderdale? It is my first time coming to Mezcal Lauderdale. Well, I guess, are you considered, can you consider yourself a Mezcal drinker? Or is this your first time getting exposed to the spirit? No. So I'm actually a newcomer to the Mezcal industry. I love Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul. So I've been on some Dos Nombres for a little while now. So I'm trying to get my foot in the door into the Mezcal industry. And this has been a perfect opportunity to show me what's good, what's, what's there and what's popping in the industry. So what have you been interested in? What has sort of caught your eye here? I One fact I learned today about Mezcal is that it should never be too heavy on your nose. We should never smell too smoky of a flavor. Uh, it's going to be too overpowering for your throat, you know? So we want that smoky in the nose, but it should never be too heavy. So that's been the most interesting thing for me to feel today, as I thought Mezcal, when you smell it, should be smoky right away. That's awesome. Do you have any particular brands that you are really excited to try and love, love, love? I do. Unfortunately, to say this, because LeBron's already got it like that, but, you know, King Goat, LeBron's Mezcal was so, so light right here. What do we have? Was amazing. And say her name over there. Which one? The Grana? Yeah. That was the... No, this Mezcal Union. Best Mezcal I tasted all day. Really? What about it? So smooth. Smoky, fiery, peppery, but smooth. Liked it. Really, really good in a craft cocktail. I love a craft cocktail. Awesome. I'm a tequila drinker, so. Do you think that this may take you off of tequila and now and straight into mezcal? You know, once you put the tequila on me, you can never take it out. So I'll always be a tequila girly, but I will definitely be putting my foot in the door with a lot of different mezcals now. I'm going to go over to Primo Liquors. 
later today, get my mezcal and get it rocking. Here we are at Canyon, you know, drinking our mezcals, doing our thing. Mezcal Fort Lauderdale, you already know what the fuck it is. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So there we were. Mezcal Lauderdale, another event is in the books. Absolutely fantastic event. I really do enjoy this one. I think it's very well run. And I'm really looking forward to next year's event. Next week, Florida Beer Podcast will be back. We're going back to beer. Uh, I do believe we're going to be visiting. So the last couple of episodes, we have been in Sebastian talking to Pete Anderson at Peridolia Brewing. If you know anything about craft beer in Sebastian, Florida, you know he's very close to somebody else. And that somebody else is going to be our next interview. Who that is, I'll let you know next week obviously when that episode drops is on social media we are at florida beer blog on instagram and twitter fl beer blog is on facebook we're on the interwebs at floridabeerblog.com and floridabeerpodcast.com if you want to reach out to us with sponsorship or any other questions feel free to do so at floridabeerblog at gmail.com We are also very proud partners of the Florida Podcast Network. You can come check us out with the other shows that are on the network at floridapodcastnetwork.com as well. Our intro announcer is Jeff Brozovich. Field producer is Steve Pacala. Executive producer for the Florida Podcast Network in Grand High Poopa is Jemmy Lagonier. This is David Butler, your host and author. We will see you next week back in Sebastian, Florida for some more beer fun. Thank you so much for listening and drink Florida craft. <laughs>